Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining uh, my session today. You know, um, I'm really happy to be here with you. We are going to be covering um, a topic that's near and dear to my heart um, that I've been really um, wrestling with and trying to make a difference um, in my own organization, but then also um, in other companies around the world is raising the awareness around um, this topic around means and, means and methods in construction and how does BIM and VDC play into that? And, you know, really in this dynamic world of construction and unforeseen events and chaos and, you know, circumstances that can disrupt projects, you know, leads to delays and budget overruns and compromised quality sometimes. But what I've found is that maintaining focus and adhering to the standardized processes, you know, become paramount in overcoming these challenges. So this presentation will underscore the significance of standardization as a means of achieving business excellence during turbulent periods. By establishing purposeful organizational structures and prioritizing people, construction companies can navigate the gray area of BIM more effectively and ensure smoother project execution among, um, amidst this uncertainty. So who am I? I've been in construction for many years, um, started in construction right out of high school and worked part time while I was in college. Um, I was able to see and fortunate enough to um, experience BIM adoption firsthand in the industry, starting off in New Orleans. You know, I got to start using Revit and Navisworks and Bluebeam in 2010 and really seeing how we could leverage this technology. Um, within our own business to increase productivity. Back then, the early days of the you know, labor shortage, you were hearing murmurs about, but you weren't really feeling and experiencing it like you are today. Nevertheless, we still used and leveraged and leaned into that technology and doubled down on it by using robotic total stations, by using um, technologies such as uh, total stations, prefab, and, uh, and VR. You know, looking at applications um, beyond just Revit that would increase our um, exposure and uh, transparency into the model, bringing data into the model using uh, reality capture and drone technology. So we're going to be looking at um, a few topics here, but in a quick manner, you know, looking at the power of detailed modeling and construction, and we all know it's important. What what happens when we take that extra effort, just a little bit extra effort um, at times when it calls for courage and uh, from the times of the contractor, from the times of the architect and engineering team, but also bringing in the hands on um, side from the owner, you know, bringing in that culture of innovation to their projects and, um, and empowering everyone with data at their hands and digital delivery from concept to operations. So when they get handed the keys to their asset, they have all the data that's relevant and matching to their physical asset. And of course, optimizing the labor so that you're efficiently building and constructing the project using BIM and VDC practices um, to increase and maximize productivity while mitigating the risk, mitigating the RFIs um, on site. And then we'll recap with some key takeaways. Before we jump too far in, you know, let's look at some uh, set of instructions. Have you ever been giving a set of instructions that might be missing a few crucial steps? Here, here you can see four steps to build a house, given these uh, set of material. Seems like there might be a gap between three and four. You know, how do you really build that without having all the information or maybe even not all of the uh, expected material needed? We do know uh, from the set of instructions that the house is supposed to go upright uh, on the foundation and not on its roof. But also, if I was to build this in Photoshop or Inventor, I would need a little bit of help. You know, I, I'm OK with the computer, but um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not into uh, Photoshop and Illustrator that much. And so I would need a little bit of hand holding. So I would say my competency level is kind of down, but my confidence is pretty high. So I need some steps. What are those steps? You know, of course, you need a hand, you need a castle, and we see some foliage and uh, water feature. Um, 
But there's some steps, again, that seem to be missing. How do you get such an extravagant goal uh, accomplished in four through those steps um, provided? Okay, maybe let's make it a little bit more relatable at your house. You know, if this couple here is building uh, this piece of furniture with a set of instructions and material, sometimes it can be a bit frustrating. But what's the goal? The goal at the end of the day is to build a bedroom set, given the material and the instructions provided. Well, how do you do that? And why can it be, why is it so frustrating sometimes? Now let's bring it a little bit closer to our reality. Now, if these two individual trades are having to work together to accomplish something big, but they're given a set of instructions and, and material used to do, to do that, Sometimes those set of instructions and uh, information provided is maybe not so detailed. You know, they want to maximize the information provided so that way they can best turn over the, an accomplished um, building uh, using their craft. And when uh, RFIs are increasing and uh, co communication has the communication workflow uh, gaps are shown. But this is what we want to build. Again, why is it so frustrating sometimes? Well, it goes back to that decision making given the data or the lack thereof that you're equipped with to build. You know, we looked at industry struggles around uh, lack of information um, or misinformation to build something extravagant. But there's also a, a force against us that you're feeling right now in your job sites. You know, with nearly one in four construction workers older than 55, retirements will continue to whittle away at the construction force. And with almost 600,000 additional workers needed to uh, on job sites today, really leveraging their craft, you know, what is this going to look like exponentially 10 years from now, four years from now? You know, no number of construction workers, you know, the most entry level occupational level has accounted for nearly four out of every 10 new construction workers in 2012. So we have a good amount of less experienced workers coming in. And you can see that there are a ton of projects in your backlogs today. We see almost nine months worth of work sitting in backlogs. I hear of contractors turning away work because they're so busy. So how do they take on more work, tap into that backlog, but you're short almost 600,000 laborers today, and then build something extravagant given limited data at your hands? Well, let's look at that. Let's look at the, this detailed modeling and construction and maybe taking a little bit more effort from each angle, each stakeholder to have the mindset of what's in it for us, what's in it for the customer, what's in it for the client, what's in it for the mother delivering the child during uh, labor in the hospital, what's in it for um, the, the the new family in the mixed use high high rise downtown. You know that's that's the type of uh, persona we should be striving to protect to uh, equip with a better way of life. So, so many times I've encountered in my past the mindset of what's in it for me. And I'm here to, uh, to implore you that the mindset must change for the betterment of society, given these struggles that we're facing today. And in this dynamic world of construction, these unforeseen events and chaotic circumstances, they can disrupt projects, leading to delays in budget overruns and compromised quality. But by maintaining focus and adhering to the standardized processes, you know, it becomes paramount in overcoming these challenges. So if we want to manage properly and not just scale, that's a big topic right now in many conversations is scale. But how do you scale predictably and sustain sustainably while following go governance, while following the, the rules at hand you, um, to while you detailing and uh, providing a higher level of detail in the model. And by establishing these purposeful organizational structures to scale predictively and prioritizing people, construction companies can navigate this gray area of BIM and how it fits into the means and methods of construction 
that we're facing today. And when I say means and methods, what does that mean? What's the terminology? And if we look at a couple of definitions here, a term used in construction to describe the techniques and tactics, usually uh, temporary structures, a contractor employs to complete construction of a permanent project or structure. And another person said, means and methods of construction means the labors, labor, materials, temporary structures, tools, plant, and construction equipment in the manner and time of their use necessary to accomplish the result intended by this contract. And so we're looking at the contractor here employs these practices to accomplish the necessary result intended by the contract. And so they're there to build as builders to leverage their expertise that the owner and the architect have put together this intended design. But who owns it? Who owns that means and methods at the higher level of detail? I hear about projects of old that were built with 40 sheets of drawings. Now, when was the last time you saw 40 sheets of drawings to build the buildings you're on today? Many times it's 400 or 600 sheets of drawings with multiple pages of notes to refer back to different pages. And while the builder is there as a craft to build, I implore that we must have higher level of detailed uh, drawings and specifications and data in building from the model rather than interpreting what's these really amazing iconic buildings are to be built from a 2D environment. And, you know, this design intent phrase, you know, the intended design, sometimes when just equipped with 2D data, potentially sets up for um, risk, you know, looking at this fragmented data and lack of interoperability from 2D to 3D and uh, having spatial awareness of what's going on in the buildability and constructability of the building. Sometimes, you know, these uh, 2D uh, lack of data uh, tools that, that are provided to the contractor you know, does not enable productivity off-site, on-site. It does not enable um, other tools such as robotics to be leveraged um, on site, given the fact that they're facing the labor shortage. You know, I hear things per plans and specs only that you're supposed to build or for reference only. But then the builder is supposed to build um, given their experience, given their craft, given their knowledge historically, how they've built in the past. And construction being an experiential based craft, how do we lean down the processes and build with the labor that we have to access to today? We don't have the luxury of scaling up and scaling down when possible because everyone around us is going after and trying to scale at the same time and looking and finding the same people that you are. And so detailed modeling lies at the core of achieving enhanced efficiency and precision in construction projects. By creating this comprehensive and accurate 3D models, BIM enables project teams to visualize the entire construction process start to finish. You know, hear about end to end, cradle to grave, napkin to wrecking ball. Why, why does it have to be, hey, I did my part, tossed over to the fence to the next person in line, and uh, we call that a workflow. But really, the workflow should be from concept to renovation. Having that one source of truth, we talk, we hear for the past decade about sole source of truth. Um, and really, it's that, that is led up to interpretation. It's uh, led up with rose colored glasses, but reality, it should be it should be something we should stick to that we should believe in. That means a method shouldn't just uh, be something that we fill the gaps with and lean on our most experienced workers, because really our most experienced workers, they're getting our least, they're being our least affordable resource on the job site because they're spread so thin. They happen to be our most knowledgeable, most experienced. But again, they're becoming, they're becoming our least available resource. They're either close to or coming out of retirement but they do know how to fill the gaps when that data doesn't exist or is misinterpreted um, on the drawings. And they do know how to write correct RFIs to the design team to get the proper answer. But what about 
pointing back to that generation that's coming in that's that's filling majority of the roles right now they are our widely most available uh worker right now they are our most affordable given um their entry-level positions that they're coming in at, they're the least knowledgeable in construction, and so they're then they lean on the most experienced worker, but again, that's a scarcity or becoming a scarcity. The younger worker is harder to retain or harder to recruit. They're looking for more the experience of the work and the environment that they're working in, uh, maybe an office environment or a remote working environment. They're becoming the harder to retain. You hear about the uh, the 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 quiet quitter, people who want to move from job to job, and you know the, I'm seeing the the previous generation before me even loyal to companies for 30, 40 years, and um, I see that today at Hilti, surrounded by people 20, 30, 40 years um, at Hilti, which honestly uh, sometimes is 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 a scarcity these days, and it's commend it should be commended. But also the younger generation views the uh, industry as maybe less attractive and but they're also highly skilled in technology. So how do we how do we change the mindset of um, this aura around construction that might be less attractive by leveraging and leaning into being a tech industry? Well, by using and showcasing the technologies that you're all using today, you're using uh advanced software and computers you're using advanced technology in the job site robotics drones reality capture let's expose that and promote it um, as not toys but tools in construction you know these technologies streamline workflows they simplify complex tasks and they empower existing workers to take on more sophisticated roles but they're doing it effectively and they're maximizing their output and contributing to project success Excuse me, but these technologies require input. They require data from the source to help these workers, to help uh, the tech savvy worker. And so by having a more detailed model at the onset of the project, we'll then just best set the next generation up for success. You know, in turn, the model detail requires less thinking, less interpretation on site because we've captured and we've retained that experience of the of the craft of the worker of the skilled worker and embedded that into the drawings embedded that into the means and methods of construction you know many of these new workers don't know life without the internet they don't get triggered like i do when they hear the dial-up aol uh tone and they're looking for um cool places to work i mean construction is cool um, i love seeing a uh, built environment around me after just leaving a computer of a 3D model, now you can, it's tangible. You can drive by it. You hear about uh, fathers and grandfathers that say, hey, I worked on that. I built that. I remember that project. You know, it's tapping back into that pride of, of the worker and uh, really leveraging that and bringing that forward. But it's not just attracting new talent and retaining them. It's also optimizing the workers that you do have. How do we go from um, an experiential-based uh, workflows to now innovation, innovative workflows. Well, it's that pre-planning and pre-thinking using VDC and BIM to then enable your on-site team to be more productive in a safe, um, sustainable manner, such as the ones you see here. Yeah, they have more workers. You can count and they have more laborers doing the work, doing the task. But you know what? They're doing it much more efficiently, much more productive than they are on the left. The left is historical, it's legacy ways of working. Don't get me wrong, it still happens today. But on the right, they're able to uh, to increase their installation by tenfold, twentyfold, because now they're thinking about how things are supported, how the MEP systems are going to be attached. And when they wheel in these racks, they hoist them into place and they don't have to touch it again. Here's another example of where our racks were modeled, engineered, provided the drawings with bills of material and cut lengths and uh, shipped to the job site. And the workers were then, because they installed base exactly in the model, they were able to install it per the drawings, per the engineered set of solutions. 
And again, thinking back to this, the what I was saying earlier about standardization, if we could have one rack that would apply to one corridor, then we want to maximize uh, the standardized rack as much as possible and, and reduce the amount of on-site thinking needed and just say, hey, this one rack goes in this, uh, this corridor, but it's going to go there 20, 30 times um, every five feet. Thus, we're reducing the amount of components needed and we're re reducing the amount of interpretation needed to support those MEP systems. So in closing, to sum up of what we've explored, you know, these challenges and solutions in the AEC industry, the labor shortage has pushed to use technology and standardization. Our examination of means and methods has shown how construction techniques and advanced BIM practices can work together effectively. And detail is so crucial. Detailed modeling isn't just about pixels. It's, it affects efficiency and results. And detailed models empower field labor with precision and confidence. Thanks to the people, processes, and technology prioritize people. And those people use technology and they standardize methods to help us overcome the labor shortage. I'll say that, say that again, prioritizing people, using technology, and standardizing methods help us overcome the labor shortage. Looking ahead, let's use tools to build legacies, not just structures. And the labor shortage encourages innovation and empowerment and industry standards. And by focusing on people using technology, we bridge the gap between challenge and success. Remember, you're not just building structures, we're shaping the future. And every well-considered detail matters. This gray area of BIM becomes a space for innovation. As pioneers, we guide progress, leaving our mark on the skyline and those who benefit from our innovation. Thank you for being a part of this journey. Let's keep building, inspiring, and refining possibilities. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'll stick around for our uh, time uh, during the chat and be monitoring the chat. Thank you so much uh, again for joining me today and hearing my passion and, and this care that we should be taking when building together. Um, really appreciate it again. Thank you uh, for joining. Have a great rest of your uh, BIM Coordinator Summit.